Hello, and welcome back to the Simplifiers podcast, where we take topics in work and in life and simplify them. And friends, Happy New Year to you all. I am so thrilled to speak on the topic that we're speaking on today because I feel like this is a fresh season, a new energy in place. And yes, 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 you can have a fresh start at any point in the year. Let's say that out loud. But you know, sometimes in January, it is nice to kind of step off the hamster wheel and rethink of like, well, where is a deeper purpose in life? Am I on the track uh, for my entire life? And, and, and am I fi- finding my calling? And does anything need to shift again ever so slightly? So given that's our topic to simplify, like how to find deeper purpose in life, I have the perfect guest for us today. His name is Dan Millman, and he's an author, and he teaches the peaceful warrior's way here in the United States and all around the world. Now, you might be familiar with his work because he's been an author of 18 books, and they've published in 29 different languages. Millman's a former world champion athlete, a university coach, martial arts instructor, and college professor. His bestseller, Way of the Peaceful Warrior, was adapted into a feature film starring Nick Nolte. So I'd like to welcome to the Simplifiers podcast, Dan Millman. Hey, Dan. Hey, Mary. Good to be here. I'm so pleased that you're here. And if anyone has not seen the movie, Peaceful Warrior came out a few years back with Nick Nolte. Uh, I watched it over the weekend and loved it. it it's just such a nice um, and also hard story sometimes to watch because it, it, it does hit into the human spirit. And of course, it's your story. You as a as a teen and a growing up as a young man. Um, tell us a little bit about that journey there. Well, it's based loosely on my story. Um, I was a young athlete starting out. I just discovered I loved jumping up and down on a trampoline, which led to a college scholarship, a world championship, and so on. Yeah. Uh, and, and eventually I coached at Stanford University and then uh, went to Oberlin College in Ohio, where I taught psychophysical education. Mm. Um, and that was part of my preparation. But after that, as, as you know, Mary, I as described in my new book, um, I worked with over a 20 year period, uh, intense preparation with four different, radically different mentors. But in terms of the idea of purpose and simplifying yeah. for, for uh, your listeners, um, I, I need to explain the term peaceful warrior. I was teaching a course at Oberlin in Aikido and Tai Chi, two martial arts. Yeah. And I was going to call it the way of the warrior, but that didn't quite fit. And I thought, a light bulb went off. And I said, why don't I call it the way of the peaceful warrior? And that's how organically that term came about. And I ended up titling my first book with that term. Mm. But really, it's not about me. It's not some special club you can join. Basically, I view everyone as a peaceful warrior in training. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Women, men, it doesn't matter. Uh, Because we're all striving to live with a peaceful heart. But there are times in our lives we need a warrior's spirit just to face the challenges of everyday life. So that's what I mean by the term peaceful warrior. That's why I titled the new book, Peaceful Heart, Warrior Spirit, uh, because it really applies to all of us. And much of my work has been around this, the core of life purpose because it's so important in mm. all our lives. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and to back up a little, I, I think when we first think of a warrior, we think of somebody charging forth with a sword in hand and a shield and going mm. into battle. And it's very, um, I don't know, aggressive. <laughs> and I think that, uh, you know, in, in some aspects of my life, I'm in my mid-40s. I haven't lived a whole life, obviously. But, you know, there are moments where I have felt like I've had that very aggressive spirit. And sometimes that works, but not sustainable, nor a good idea for all moments, right? Right. I agree. Uh, We need to find a balance between passivity, uh, victimhood, and uh, aggressiveness. I just use the term assertiveness. I prefer that. Mm. And warrior spirit is not about fighting necessarily, except with some of our inner demons like insecurity, self-doubt, other kind of fear. Um, So we have that kind of battle. But normally it's more about um, in everyday life, it's viewing our lives as a form of spiritual weight training. Mm. And if you don't lift any weights, you don't get any stronger. Right. And we've all faced difficulties, adversity, physical, emotional, or mental pain in our life. But I think if we look back on that time, those difficult times, we notice we're a little bit wiser, a little bit stronger. 
uh, and maybe even a broader sense of perspective for having gone through that. So we don't have to pretend to like adversity or difficulty or challenge, Mm -hmm. but we need to keep that thread of attention that we will grow stronger and wiser as we face it. And as we've challenged past fears, we can focus on new ones. You know, Custom Auto, a boxing coach, once said, heroes and cowards feel exactly the same fear. Mm. They just respond differently. Yeah, yeah. And that's our key. Yeah, and I think that that's it. I think, you know, what I've learned uh, in my short time on the planet so far is it's about your response and reaction to whatever happens. Because there will be peaks and valleys in life, right? There will be great, Mm -hmm. triumphant incredible moments and there will be some very dark cold isolating moments as well right absolutely yeah absolutely there it's just inevitable for all of us and it's how we face it and that's what i mean by the warrior spirit yeah. and speaking of peaks there's a scene in the peaceful warrior movie where you'll remember that dan my character and socrates played by nick nolte are walking up this big hill and they get to the top and dan has this revelation he says you know socrates i just realized it's not the destination that makes us happy it's the journey mm-hmm. now there's a certain wisdom in that it's true most of our lives are spent on the journey not just reaching one destination after another uh, and yet without a destination in mind, there is no journey. We just wander around because I believe we're hardwired goal seekers. You know, watching my granddaughter when she was little crawling across the floor, when she was an infant, she wasn't just exercising. Mm. She was going for something, Mm -hmm. something she wanted. And so from our point A, we need to find a point B. Uh, I would define success as making progress toward a meaningful goal. Mm -hmm. So I think we're all hardwired to strive for something. And the happiest, most fulfilled people are not just those who've reached their goal, but who are moving toward it. It gives us a sense of absorption in life and and a meaningful uh, pursuit. Mm. And, you know, I mean, how many times have we found ourselves in life? And it may be a glimpse, it may be a week, a year, a decade where we feel a bit rudderless, like we don't have a goal in mind. We're just sort of, you know, clocking it in and and time goes by so fast. And then you go, hang on, how did that happen? How did this, how did I get here? Right. Well, um, you know, a man actually came to me once in my, when I lived in Marin County, California. Now I live in Brooklyn, New York, Mm -hmm. um, to be closer to our daughters and and grandkids. Um, But he came to my office and he put cash down on the table for the session and sat down and I said, well, I'd like to know what your purpose is, what your goal is, so I can help you with that. And he said, oh, I have no purpose. Mm. And I said, well, if you, if you did have one, what might it be? But no, he wouldn't bite. He just mm. said, I have no purpose at all. So um, I said, well, in that case, I really don't know if I can help you, but hey, it was really nice meeting you. Uh, have a great day. Mm. And he stood up and he looked at the money he put on, the, on my desk and he said, wait a minute. You know, I have 45 minutes with you now, Dan. I paid good money for this. And I said, you know what? I think you've just discovered a purpose. Mm. And I said, and when our session is done, you'll find another purpose, which is finding your way to your automobile and driving to where you're going without hitting any objects or people. And when you get to where you're going, another purpose will appear. <laughs> so I think we all have a purpose moment to moment. It's hard to know our cosmic purpose, even though I've written several books to help people with that idea. The main purpose, um, the fourth one I list in one of my small books, is our purpose in the moment. Mm. So we can't always know our long-term purposes clearly. Uh, it's you, You've heard this, this analogy before that we're like cars driving in the night yeah. and we can only see as far as our headlight beam, but we can make the whole journey that way. So we have to trust the process to some degree and follow our hearts and our instincts. But at the same time, we always know our purpose in this moment. I know mine right now. You know yours. Mm-hmm. But we forget. And and I think that that's the hardest part is we you know, almost like goldfish in a in a little uh, pond is like you got a seven second uh, attention span and then you forget. And I think that there it, it kind of akins back to meditation or yoga. Like you know when when your facilitator says you know if if your thoughts wander just nudge them back to the center. And I yeah. feel like I'm constantly nudging myself back to center. <laughs> You know, in this process of continual forgetfulness, uh, how, what advice would you give someone like that? Sure. 
Um, well, there's a, a story I tell about uh, Socrates and I mm. are walking down the street, and I'm asking him um, about, you know, what do I do about the Vietnam War? Because back then I was at UC Berkeley and during the Vietnam War, and I said, my friends are protesting the war. I'm doing all this inner work on myself. Yeah. And he didn't say anything at first. And then suddenly he turned to me and said, Dan, I'll give you $5 if you can slap me on the cheek. Come on, mm. go for it. Mm. I didn't know what he was talking about <laughs> in response to my comment. Uh, uh, like starving children in the world and oppressed peoples. <laughs> Shouldn't I be more active in, in the world? Yeah. And he said, um, you know, come on. And I figured it was some kind of test. So I bobbed and weaved and took a swing at him. And I found myself on the ground in a rather painful wrist lock. You may recall I got this scene into the movie at the last minute. Mm. Um, and as he let me up to my feet, you know, he said, you notice a little leverage can be very effective? I said, yeah, I noticed, shaking out my wrist. Mm. And he said, well, it's wonderful if you want to help people. Do what your heart tells you, but don't ignore the work on yourself so you can exert the right leverage at the right place at the right time. Mm. So it's not a matter of inner work or outer activity. It's both. Yeah. We need to pay attention to both. And part of that is happened when we were in the gym one night and I was doing some dismount off the high bar. You know, I was a gymnast and I did a full twisting double somersault and I, mm -hmm. I stuck my landing. Well, most people realize that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I landed solid. I went, yes. And I figured that was a good place to end the workout. Yeah. So um, I ripped off my sweatshirt, threw it in my bag and we were walking down the hallway after that. And he said, you know, Dan, that last movie you did was really sloppy. Hmm. And I went, what? That was the best dismount I did in weeks, Sock. And he said, I'm not talking about the dismount. I'm talking about the way you took off your sweatshirt and put it in your bag. Hmm. And see, he reminded me I was treating one moment as special hmm. and another moment as ordinary. Hmm. And it reminded me once again that there are no ordinary moments. There are no ordinary moments. The quality of our moments become the quality of our life. And then he added something. Um, and, and this was something I never forgot. And this gets to the heart of your question too. He said, the difference between us, Dan, is you practice gymnastics. I practice everything. And I, I, first I didn't know what he meant by that. And I, he said, I practice standing, walking, breathing, signing my name. How many of us try to sign our name better than we did last time? Hmm. Um, and the, the idea of practicing, most of us do things all day. Yeah. We do the, our homework, we do the laundry, we do the dishes, we do whatever we need to do. But as soon as we view that as a form of practice, we aim to refine it or improve it. And in doing so, it draws us into the moment. So daily life, moment to moment, can become a meditation. Now we forget, I forget all the time. But when I remember, I again practice. I'm practicing sitting here right now. I'm practicing speaking with you. Yeah. And it brings me back to the moment. And daily life again becomes a meditation. It's We don't necessarily have to sit down for X number of minutes a day and sit quietly and meditate and look at our, you know, repeat our mantra or whatever we do. Because daily life can be our meditation. Mm. There was somebody who came to me once and said, um, she said, you know, uh, I just read your first book, Way of the Peaceful Warrior, and now I'm really interested in spiritual practice, but I don't have the time. How can I? She said, I'm married. I have a husband and, and, and three children and a full-time job. How can I manage that? And I said, I reminded her that her husband, her children, her full-time job were her primary spiritual practices. It is. Yeah. She didn't have to go elsewhere. Yeah. And you know what? They demand and develop more than sitting in a cave and meditating. I know because I've done both. So the arena of what I call the peaceful warrior is everyday life, moment to moment. And such beautiful um, a thought. And it's one that I will definitely simmer on, not only today, but this month, because I think that that's, that's it. When we awaken to the reality of how powerful every moment can be, um, it, it I think... It makes me think of uh, the analogy, I'm sure you've heard it, where uh, when you think about the future, that's when you get anxious. When you think about the past for some, that's where you feel depression or sadness. Regret. Regret. Or regret. Yeah, shame. Yeah. 
But when you think yeah. about the present, there's just possibility. That that's all it is. It's just yeah. you know a, electric possibility um, for every moment to be deep and, and profound, right? Even in the process of tucking your kids into bed, or uh, you know, absolutely doing a presentation from stage, or walking your dog. I mean, it's all mm -hmm. there's all potential in that. So I kind of want to shift gears a little because I, sure. I one thing that stood out to me in your latest book, Peaceful Heart, Warrior Sp Spirit, is, you know, and it goes through your your life and, and the four different mentors that you've met over um, the course of your journey. But I actually want to talk about time as a little bitty boy. I mean, as a young man, uh, I remember there was something in there where somebody had told you a valuable life lesson of stop thinking about it and jump. Can you tell us the origin story of that and, and how specifically, how maybe that phrase has guided you, but also maybe morphed in meaning in your lifetime? Sure, sure. Yeah, in the new book, I do start with my foundations, my childhood, mm. to show what prepared me for these four mentors that I describe in the book. Yeah. And um, I was, uh, my friend Steve, you saw, I was about maybe six years old, mm -hmm. maybe five years old. He was three years older than I was. So he was streetwise and maybe he was uh, nine or 10. Sure. And we all climbed to the roof of a house under construction on a street. We loved to explore them. We were on the roof, about 20, 22 feet high. And there was a big pile of sand below us, a big sand pile that we we're going to use for construction. And so Steve jumped off, and then his friends jumped off. They were all older than I was, and went whoop, in, in, up to their knees, you know, in the sand pile. And said, mm -hmm. "Come on, Danny, jump!" And I wanted to so much, but I was afraid. Yeah. And I went to the edge, and I went back, and I went to the edge, and that's when he yelled, "Danny, just stop thinking and jump!" Mm -hmm. And I did, and I just knew I could bend my knees and push off, and I saw he stopped, and I just jumped. And that became a metaphor in a way for gymnastics, for my trampoline days and, yeah. and, my, and my life. It didn't always serve um, in every situation. <laughs> Some, you know, we don't want to think without acting or act without thinking. Um, so we have to find a balance. But that's where that came from, the idea of uh, not getting too wrapped up in thinking forever. You know, thinking about doing something is the same as not doing it. Yeah, yeah. Pre-planning and all the, uh, you know, scented gel pens and day planners and <laughs> journals that people buy, not including myself, of course, you know, but uh, we, we do that. We, we, we go into overthink process and I, I've found myself stumbling over the last few years in particular when I'm ready to make a big leap and go, Ooh, maybe not yet, you know, because I, I overthink the, the possibilities of what could go wrong, Right. And sometimes we need to prepare. Yeah. Sometimes fear is our, our, you know, fear is a wonderful um, servant, but a terrible master. Yes. We've all heard that probably. And so sometimes we need to prepare and, and uh, think twice about something. Uh, but on the other hand, there are times we know we're ready. Mm -hmm. We just overthink it. Yeah. So it is really a balance. It's not a formula I could give anybody. Um, but well, yeah. So there are times we do things on impulse that may not be the wisest course. Sure. So it again, it's finding that balance. Mm. And I think that there's something to um, the building of courage. You know, when you you do just stop thinking about it, make the leap with the caveat that this is not hurting someone else and it's not harming myself, right? Um, right. But when you do it enough times, it, it gives you the confidence to leap, um, whether it is big or small kind of ahead of you, right? Yes. Competence leads to confidence. We don't start endeavors confident. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not natural to do that. If we're waiting to feel confident before we do something, that may not, may be a long time. So we have to keep a beginner's mind. You know, I've learned so much from my children and now mm. my grandchildren, just watching them look at the world with fresh eyes, yeah. spontaneous. They're more in the moment. And they only begin to anticipate and think about the past and future as we know uh, when they're maybe five, six, seven years old. When they're two, like my two and a half year old granddaughter, she's just right here, right now. <laughs> yes. Um, and you know, we've all heard that. I, everybody knows it's good to live in the present moment, yes. but what does that actually mean? Because yeah. the present moment, um, you know, how do you grasp the present moment? It's a nanosecond, a millionth of a second. How? Where do you? Wh what is the present moment? What? When teachers like me suggest living in the present, we're saying handle what's in front of you. Yeah. 
Because what most people don't fully grasp is that the future and the past do not exist. They only exist in the form of what we call memory or imagination. Mm -hmm. But all we ever have is the eternal present, this present moment, this present moment, this present moment. The rest is a kind of illusion. But it's a wonderful human capacity to remember and learn from, reflect on, and also to imagine a future, plan our day, for example. That can be useful. We just don't want to get too attached to the plans because they have a way of changing. Yes. You, you know. But it, it, to simplify our life by focusing on the present moment, first of all, there are no, there's no busy mind in the present moment. We cannot think about anything in the present. Once we think about something, it's going to be something we're thinking about from the past, what we call the past, or the future. Or from the future. Yeah. But in the present moment, there's only pure awareness. It's as if I, if I was with you right now and I tossed you my keys or a ball and said, catch. In that moment, you'd be like a cat reaching out, pure awareness to catch that. Mm. And that's why people like to throw frisbees and play games and do musical instruments and perform. It pulls them back to the present which is pretty much serene and absorbed. It's like the zone, uh, that sense of flow. Uh, it's only when our mind gets busy and starts saying, but what if I hadn't done that? Shoulda, coulda, woulda. Mm-hmm. And what's going to happen in that meeting later on? That's why, even for our our conversation now, I did not prepare. Yeah. I just open up and follow your lead and, and have a conversation with you. So, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's how I... That's how I roll. Yeah, and I, I think that it's it's refreshing and it's such a good reminder to anyone that's listening out there, including myself, um, of that kind of different spirit, if you will, um, of living life. Because we, it's so easy to get caught up in the noise and the to do list and everything that's that's trying to pull your attention, um, you know, either in your work or in your non work life. And, you know, I think about my dog. This is so silly. But my dog, he's a pug. He's about two years old. He is the happiest spirit on the planet. Just happy to be here. Mm -hmm. Never met an enemy in his entire life. He's actually training to be a therapy dog because he's just such an an amazing being. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think about the human spirit. Like, we're so wrapped up in in all these things that if we could just learn a few things from our mammal friends, like my dog, we'd actually find that deeper purpose in life. We'd actually find a a sense of peace that we all are longing for, right? That's a wonderful point, Mary, because uh, our role models and mentors are everywhere. And you're bringing up even our animal friends. Yeah. We can learn wonderful things from them. We don't normally think of them as teachers, though, except in sentimental moments. But mm-hmm. absolutely, there's that animal part of us that, that wants to play yeah. like a puppy. Yeah. And we need to also accept that and embrace it. Yeah, absolutely. And why do you think we as humans yearn for a deeper purpose in life? Like, why do you think we, we are wired that way? Uh, the why is tough. You know, you can I can make up any number of whys. I have trouble with whys. Hows, maybe I can yeah. talk about. But why, I can only conjecture. Yeah. Uh, it just seems to be from our the young age, even like an infant, we seem to move toward things uh, yeah. with goals, short-term goals. And later on, we may form some long-term goals. You know, it's funny, between us and our goals, For entrepreneurs, I'm an entrepreneur um, and and, uh, a father and a grandfather, and I have goals Mm -hmm. day to day, moment to moment. Um, You know, I once asked a little gymnast, I said to her, you know, uh, I was doing some coach coaching in a gym um, for a kid's class. And I said, what is your goal? Mm. Uh, and she said, I want to be in the Olympics. And I went, that's great, you know. Mm -hmm. But recognizing that six people get to be in the Olympics and there are hundreds of thousands of gymnasts I said that's a good long term goal a good idea but what is your goal now she said oh I have to do my push ups I said great Mm -hmm. she could do that she could manage that Mm -hmm. so I think it's important for us to manage our goals manage them in the sense of make them uh, reachable step by step that's why I define success again not reaching the mountaintop but every step we take in the right direction 
Mm. Because if we're going for the mountaintop, every step is a failure because we haven't reached the top yet. Right. I used to fail 50 times in the gym a day, crashing and falling until I finally learned what I learned. So I, I took failure in stride. Literally, it was part of the process. But many of us are afraid of what we call failure. Um, so I would just, you know, step by step, and I started to define each step. I could pat myself on the back. Hey, that's you just had a little success. Mm-hmm. And then another one. So I think it's important for any entrepreneur to keep that focus on everyday successes, just making a step in the right direction, which is why I recommend people dream big, but start small and then connect the dots. Yes, I 100% agree. I, I talk about that as like just having tiny wins, you know, the, the, the little moments every single day or every single week that you have individually or your team has to celebrate those along the way. And I think that we do get wrapped up in Um, comparing against others or thinking we're supposed to be somewhere where, you know, by this age, this whatever. And um, I think that's where we get off course is, is, as you say, you know, focusing on the now, connecting the dots and moving forward. Let me just interject because you mentioned the word compare. That's one of my missions Mm. is to remind people. That's all I do is offer reminders of what we already know at deeper levels, but we tend to forget. And I remind people, do not compare yourself to anyone else. I see young people depressed because they're seeing how much fun everyone else is having Mm -hmm. on Instagram, on Facebook, and so on. Everyone's showing their best self. Look how much fun I'm having. And and the moment we compare ourselves to someone else, we're either going to feel superior or inferior. Mm -hmm. And it's a profound disrespect for our own process. You know, when I was coaching gymnastics, I learned some people learn somersaults faster than others. Mm. But those who take longer to learn often learn them better than the ones who learn them quicker. Mm. So we have to respect our way of learning, our way of living, and just stop comparing to others and just live our lives and respect the uniqueness of our own story. There's not a single one on the planet exactly like ours. Exactly. You're so spot on. And I feel like in in the book, the latest book, you know, this really accounts your spiritual quest in life and and how, you know, you've gone through um, decade after decade and and you've met these four primary mentors. Um, Let's go through those briefly and and just give an idea of what the teachings were like. So the four mentors were the professor, the guru, the warrior priest, and the sage. Talk to us about those. Okay, now I should say that I've had female teachers and role models as well, but it just happened, including my wife. Um, But these happen to be male figures that that just happen to be that way. So um, each of them were radically different. The significance of these is some people choose one martial art, one religion, Mm. one path, one approach to diet or exercise, and they do that for many years. Yeah. My calling has been to look at breadth, get a perspective. So I've done many different martial arts, different approaches to exercise and different paths. And some people might have one guru or or teacher they stay with. Um, Having these particular four represent different aspects of the spiritual journey. They were real people and I Mm -hmm. named them and so on. But the professor had a spiritual technology incredible exercises from a global heritage of spiritual traditions and practices. Um, And that took me so far. I mean, I got much better at doing inner work, breath control, different breathing practices, relaxation techniques, models of the levels of consciousness and our uh, approaches to stress release. And I learned a great deal about myself uh, my body felt more uh, youthful when I finished this in 40-day intensive, 10 hours a day, then more advanced trainings and so on. Mm. But it only could take me so far. I ended up moving for various reasons on, and I discovered the guru. He was, he's written many books. His, he's lauded. He's an American-born guru. He's not Indian. He's not Chinese. He's just American-born, mm. and he happened to be homegrown, and um, he got... Uh, a degree in English from Stanford or, or from Columbia and then a, a master's uh, um, at, uh, at Stanford University, very well-educated. Mm. Um, so he's lauded his works, his writings. Um, 
and but it's a totally different approach. He said, I'd rather beat you with a stick than tell you to meditate your way to enlightenment. Hmm. He was kind of a radical teacher. Yeah. Um, it was all about a relationship with, say, the big picture, with the spirit, with the divine, through this particular man. I was in his community, living the conditions, very balanced conditions of diet, exercise, and so on, yeah. for almost eight years. And then later, I discovered the warrior priest, very different from the others. Mm. Uh, now, after I wrote Way of the Peaceful Warrior after studying with the first two mentors, and the other two influenced my life and work from then on. Um, the warrior priest was an adventurer. He was a martial arts teacher, a metaphysician, a healer. Uh, a fascinating, adventurous type guy, mm. as I describe in, in the book, um, he gave me the, the life purpose information, uh, this rather secret material until I wrote the book, The Life You Were Born to Live. Mm. Um, and so he was really, really instrumental. He, he, he taught me to teach. For 14 years, I taught spiritual growth through knife fighting. Mm. Wow. Now that sounds pretty strange, yeah. but there was a test at the end and people went through shifts like you couldn't believe they had to, to quote unquote, survive the, the final test. Mm. Um, it's, it wasn't really about knife fighting, but it sure gets people's attention. Mm. It was quite dramatic. And he had that flair for the dramatic. But f to make this short, um, I ended up then studying with the sage who brought me back down to earth mm. and radically simplified my life. Now, first of all, there was a writer named Barbara Rasp mm -hmm. who said, the lesson is simple, the student is complicated. Mm. You know, we complicate everything. We complicate food, sex, living. And by focusing on what we ha need to do now in the present moment, yeah. rather than necessarily trying to fix our insides. Now, there's some people who do need therapy. Their, their cognitive need, needs readjustment, um, their, their, their way of perceiving the world, maybe off base and so on, to cleanse the doors of perception and bring them clarity. But for most of us, it's really about just bringing our attention to this moment. Mm. And again, the mind quiets in the present moment. And, you know, sometimes when we wake up, I'm sure fellow entrepreneurs can relate. We have 16 things to do that day. Mm -hmm. But Really, my life is like yours and very busy, mm -hmm. but it's also very simple because I recognized I can only do one thing at a time. Even those who believe they're multitaskers are really putting their attention on one thing or another or trying to split their attention. Yeah. Um, so and we can only do one thing at a time. And, and that's, that's what simplifies our life more than anything. And rather than trying to fix our insides and have just the right emotions and just the right thoughts or a quiet mind before we can live well, it's focusing on the question, what do I need to do now? Mm. And there's always an answer to that. And I really appreciated reading this latest book because I feel like a lot of us have been on a, a, our own spiritual quest of, of different shapes and sizes. No matter how old or young you are, you have been on one, whether conscious or unconscious sometimes as well, right? And I think that that is true in, in what you said. I think that there are um, gurus and mentors and coaches and all things that you follow for a season, and, and that's what you needed in that moment. And it's okay to move on to a next thing and a, a broader sense of awareness. It, it's kind of like painting um, a beautiful painting and and deciding to move into a different color palette and go, oh, well, that brings exactly. a whole different perspective, a whole exactly. different depth to what this, this canvas looks like, which is my life, right? Yes. We handle what's in front of us. We stay open to opportunities. Yeah. You never know what life's going to deliver. I've certainly learned that. Mm -hmm. And and my life in Peaceful Heart Warrior Spirit, the new book, is not just about my search. It's about, it is the true uh, story of my spiritual quest, but it's also in a way it can shed light on anyone's quest. Mm -hmm. And we're all on a quest. Whether we call it a spiritual quest or not, we are all moving towards something in our life, in our destiny. Yes. And just to end up on your website, you have something called the Life Purpose Calculator. Will you tell me about that? 
Sure. Well, it, simply put, anybody who goes to PeacefulWarrior.com, they'll see the life purpose calculator. They click on it. They put in their date of birth. And it, it's free. Uh, mm-hmm. And it'll give a taste of the depth of material I have in, in one of my books and the Life Purpose app that people can uh, access as well. Mm-hmm. But they can just go to the Life Purpose Calculator, visit it put in their date of birth, and they can even do a relationship number with someone else and see the issues that can come up around that particular relationship. Um, it's sold over a million copies, maybe two million over the, over the years, this particular book. It's uncannily accurate in mm. terms of uh, it's useful. Uh, I can't really explain scientifically, but neither can I find the square root of a sonnet. <laughs> yes. Some things aren't accessible. To it, the, it's the okay, theory. Dan. I don't know how a microwave oven works, but we still use it all <laughs> right. the time. So exactly. it's, it's absolutely fine. Um, exactly. Yeah, I, I encourage you guys out there that are listening. If you are looking to pick up a new book this winter or spring, um, check out his latest book. It's called Peaceful Heart. Warrior Spirit, The True Story of My Spiritual Quest, and also um, the other book that we alluded to but and, and might be an add-on for you to consider is The Four Purposes of Life. And just real quick, a summation of those four purposes, Dan, um, can we go through those real quick? Sure. Learning life's lessons, uh, and it's the implication that daily life will teach us all that we need to learn to mm-hmm. evolve as human beings. The second is finding our career and calling, and I differentiate the two. Our calling is what we're moved to do, what we would choose to do in our discretionary time. Our career is what produces an income. Yeah. Sometimes they combine into one, maybe in your case and mine, Mary, mm-hmm. um, but sometimes they're separate. And the third purpose is the, this mysterious life purpose system that I just alluded to on, yeah. at the life purpose calculator. Yeah. People can get more information. And the fourth, again, we discussed this, is our purpose in this present moment. Yes, in the present, always now. And that is a gentle reminder for all of us as we move into this new year uh, and focus on where we're headed in life and in our work. And I think purpose can be found in both areas equally, right? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Dan, as we wrap up, there's a few questions I like to ask you that I ask everyone on the podcast. And again, thank you so much for your time today. Um, sure. My first question is this. Tell me, what's one book or blog that you're reading these days that's either inspiring you or poking holes and challenging your belief system? Sure. Um, yeah, I love that when it actually shifts my perceptions. Mm-hmm. And there are a couple of books I can mention, but the latest was Humankind by Rutger uh, mm-hmm. Bregman. And it's really a more positive spin on human beings. It's easy to become cynical about all these things. We've heard about the Stanford Prison Experiment, which he belies in the book. Mm. Um, And we get this negative view of human beings and this selfish gene and all that sort of thing. But he has solid research behind that. Um, And by the way, Isabel Wilkerson also wrote a book called Cast, Mm. which just kind of expanded my mind to understand uh, much deeper elements in terms of our relations with other people and so on. So there are a couple of books, but uh, I love when I find a book um, yeah, that, that shifts my attitudes. A hundred percent. Well, we'll link that up in the show notes for people if you guys are curious and want to check that out. By the way, all the things we talked about, you can find over at thesimplifierspodcast.com. So tell us, who's one person in your network, somebody that you know personally, you just feel is up to brilliant things. We could shine a spotlight on them and who knows, maybe one day we'll have them on the podcast. Well, yeah, somebody who comes to mind, there are a couple, but I'll, I'll mention Patricia Ryan Madsen. She was a drama teacher at Stanford University when my daughter went there, and um, she wrote a book called Improv Wisdom, mm-hmm. and it's about just showing up, um, and it's about uh, it, the art of improvisation in everyday life. So um, you might enjoy talking mm-hmm. with her. She's Professor Emeritus at Stanford, Love lives it. in the Bay Area. Love it. The Bay Area. So I believe gratitude and simplicity go hand in hand. Tell me, what are you grateful for today? Well, the most obvious answer, since I deal with the moment, is I'm grateful to speak with you and have a chance to share with your audience. Mm. Um, but in general, wow, that's a longer answer. Um, I'm grateful for the life I've been given, even with its ups and downs and difficulties that I describe in, in the new book. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's an amazing chance to experience uh, existence as a human being. Mm, and I'm grateful for you too as well, Dan. Mm. Thank so you, Mary. My final question for you today is this. Someone somewhere is listening to you and I right now, and maybe they are doing a big leap 
They're they're shifting the whole thing. They're taking their etch a sketch of life and going, shake it all up and starting anew and wanting to take a spiritual quest, wanting to find deeper purpose in life. But they're just scared. What's one thing you could whisper into their ear right now, just to encourage them in this moment? Oh, the first thing that comes to mind might be stop thinking and jump. However, <laughs> <laughs> however. Um, I, I think it's important, again, to trust your process, mm. to trust the process of life unfolding. Faith. I define faith as the courage to live as if everything that happens is for our highest good and learning, yeah. that we can't really make a wrong turn as long as we learn from it. Yeah. So explore and uh, Grow your wings in the way down, as they say. Yeah, and if you can't make a wrong turn, then there's no fear really in the end. It's ultimate beauty. Yeah. Exactly. Dan, thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure.